Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> it's my pleasure to welcome you to our virtual speaker series lecture with our guest scientist, Laura Brandt from the US Fish and Wildlife Service. I'm Josh Weller of the Friends of Arthur R. Marshall Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge Board. We're thrilled to have you all with us. Grateful for your support and advocacy, as we know that most of you here tonight are members of the Friends, and we appreciate you. Thank you. A few notes, we ask that you remain on mute for the entirety of Laura's presentation. We expect to have time at the end for audience questions. Feel free to submit comments and questions in the chat box thread. Uh, we also wanna thank uh, especially our sponsor for this evening, Tuton, a creative agency here in Palm Beach County focused on digital and strategic marketing. Thank you to Ryan Boylston at, and his team at Tuton. I, don't think Ryan is here, but if Ryan is here, speak up, Ryan, and we'll have you say a few words. And I'm sure Ryan is technically oriented, and since I'm not hearing him, we'll, we'll move right on. Um, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce Laura. Laura has been a wildlife biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service based in South Florida since 1999 where she was the senior wildlife biologist at Arthur R. Marshall Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, she currently serves in a multi-agency position within the Science Applications Migratory Birds Program of the Fish and Wildlife Service. She's responsible for working with scientists and managers to facilitate the acquisition of ecological information for integration and decision-making. Laura began working on alligators and crocodiles, our subject tonight, in 1982 while at Penn State University, where she earned a BS in biology with a minor in marine science. She holds a master's degree in biological sciences from Florida International University and a doctorate degree from the Department of Wildlife Ecology and Conservation at the University of Florida. It is my pleasure to turn things over to Laura Brandt. Welcome, Laura. Great, thank you, Josh, and thank you everybody for attending. Um, I, I really enjoy doing these kinds of talks. I, uh, it's unfortunate that we can't do this in person because I, I uh, the virtual, the virtual environment's better than nothing, but in person is way better. And um, so, but just thank you all for for coming and bear with us on the on the technology. And so I'm, today I'm gonna to talk about um, alligators and crocodiles. I'm gonna spend most of the time waiting, talking about um, alligators, but I do wanna start off talking about crocodiles also and linking them to what they can tell us about the health of the Everglades and how they help us with Everglades restoration. And so assuming I can get my, whoops, slides to move forward, there we go. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the crocodilians that we have in South Florida, why we study crocodilians, then give you a little bit of basics on alligator ecology, and then a, an overview of the alligator monitoring that we've been doing uh, for the last um, 15, 20 years. All right, why is this not, there we go. So we have two native species of crocodilians in South Florida. And in fact, this is the only place in the world where we have both a native alligator and a native crocodile. And so on the left screen, you have the American alligator, which most folks are, um, are familiar with. And they're kind of black in color with a shovel-shaped snout um, and occur primarily in freshwater environments. On the right, we have the American crocodile, and they are more of an olive gray, green, yellowish color and have a more triangular snout. And in, in Florida, our crocodile, crocodile is a coastal crocodilian. It occurs in brackish water, but they, they actually would rather be in fresh water, um, but they can withstand the, the salinity. We have a third species of crocodilian, that has been introduced to South Florida and has populations in several places, including the Homestead Air Force Base um, and along Tamiami Trail. And that is the spectacled caiman. And the spectacled caiman is a cousin to the American alligator. 
and it's more closely related to alligators than the crocodiles. And you can see it looks very more similar to the alligator with a more rounded snout, um, but it is kind of the more of the coloration of the, the American crocodile. And it gets its name from the bony ridge around its eyes that makes it look like it has spectacles on it. So these are the three crocodilians that we have down here. And again, the two of them are the native species and, they, and the caiman is um, an introduced species. And if we have time, we can talk a little bit more about kind of the implications of having uh, caimans in, in the area. So the American alligator occurs in um, throughout the southeastern United States, all the way up from historically the Great Dismal Swamp in um, Virginia, all the way down to South Florida. All right, sorry guys, I, I'm trying to manage the waiting room at the same time as this. So let me just move those over. Oops, that didn't work. Let me do that. Um, down here to South Florida, and then over west to the southern part of Texas. And alligators are a tropical crocodile, I mean, a, tr a temperate tro crocodilian, meaning that they can occur in the warmer areas, but also all the way up into these cooler areas. And in fact, I did some studies on um, alligators in South Carolina, where we looked at what happens when they, um, when it gets so cold that the ponds freeze. The American crocodile, the American crocodile is a tropical, crocodilian, and its distribution is in Central and South America, the Caribbean, and the southern tip of Florida. So crocodiles that we have here are actually at the northern part of their range, whereas alligators are at the southern part of their range. And so it makes a very interesting kind of difference. Um, and we can look at the differences in the species and how that um, might be their responses to climate change might be different because one's at the southern end of the range and the other's at the northern end of the range. So why do we want to study crocodilians? Well, one of the reasons is that many of the species are rare. And so we want to conserve rare species. Another reason is they also are exploited and they, you know, people use them for livelihood. They use them for, for meat and for hides. Um, a third reason is that because we have basically moved into their environments in a lot of cases, there are human crocodile interactions. And the more we understand about the crocodilian behavior, the better we're able to develop our areas so that we can minimize the impact in the places where, where we do come in contact. And a fourth reason, and this is primarily what I'm going to um, talk about uh, today is because they can be used as ecological indicators. They can tell us a lot about the environments that they're in, um, in relation to water, in relation to system productivity, things like habitats and contaminants. So as ecological indicators for, the, for Everglades restoration, They've been selected because they are a very important component of the Everglades ecology. And Craighead uh, likened them to the buffaloes in the plain in plains in their how dominant they are in shaping the ecology of the Everglades swamps. The American crocodile is it's a flagship, it's now threatened species. It was it was downlisted from endangered, and it represents an important indicator of how we're doing with the freshwater flows into the health of the estuaries into Florida Bay, Biscayne Bay, and the Southwest Coast. So with Everglades restoration, we're trying to restore the historic Everglades um, hydrology and ecology. And we have some hypotheses about what we need to do or what has happened and how that has affected alligators and crocodiles. And so basically what we've done in the Everglades is we've altered the water depths and, and the patterns of water depths. We've altered salinity and then how the prey abundance um, is affected by that. And the result for alligators has been that there have been redu reductions in abundance and body condition. For crocodiles, the primary driver of from, that we can fix with Everglades restoration is increased salinity. And this is through freshwater flows into the estuaries. 
And these increased salinities have resulted in reduced growth rates um, and reduced densities and body condition. And so what we're trying to do is relate what we're seeing with alligators to what we're doing in terms of restoration to give us an idea of how well we're doing with um, the plans for restoration. So let me switch gears a little bit now and, and just talk about some alligator basics because there's, there's some questions that I always get asked when I give talks and, and, and people just you know, wanna know about alligators. And the first one is, well, where do alligators live? Well, so we talked a little bit about them being primarily freshwater living, loving animals. And they live in lakes and ponds. They live in marshes. They live in canals. And they live near human environments and sometimes end up in people's swimming pools. And what I tell people is that if there's a body wa of water in Florida, there's likely going to be an alligator there because they, in, in Florida, we're fortunate that we, we have alligators in, in a lot of different places. Um, and another question that people ask me is why are they important or why do we why do we want to care about them? What, you know, why don't we just get rid of them? Or what are their, what's their role in the environment? Well, alligators are, are um, very important in the Everglades environment because they're what are called ecological engineers. And so they create deep water habitats within the marsh that dries out on a natural cycle. And so if you look at the marsh environment from the air, you can see where there's drier areas and then these alligator holes, which create the um, wetter areas that act as refugia during the dry season. And so fish and turtles and other aquatic things can, can go into, into those um, slightly wetter areas. So my fish friends, joke, fish friends joke about it and they say they're not refugia for the fish, they're restaurants for the alligators and the wading birds. But, um, so they do have this very important role in creating those, um, that mosaic of, of uh, low ground, but they also create high ground with their alligator nests. And the alligator nests create, um, provide habitat for other, other species to nest. And we'll see a picture of that um, in a minute. And they also provide a place for vegetation to start growing. And so overall, alligators have this great role in providing both the high ground and the low ground within the Everglades marsh system to keep the natural fluctuations and the microtopography uh, that so many different species of wildlife like the fish and the wading birds uh, rely on. So another thing people always want to know is what do alligators eat? And so they eat fish, they eat fish of all different sizes, they eat mammals, and um, sometimes they even eat other alligators, depending on, on the conditions. And basically what I tell people is that alligators will eat anything that moves, some things that don't, and the bigger they are, the bigger the things that they eat. And so they are very opportunistic in what they eat. And some of the studies that, that have, been, have been done have shown that things like crabs and, and grass shrimp and a lot of the smaller um, critters in the environment are also an important part of alligator, alligator diet, as well as the things that in areas where there's deer or hogs or um, fish that people traditionally think of as important as alligator prey items. So how big do alligators get? Well, they do not get to be 28 feet. I'm sure you all have seen various versions on the internet of huge picture, pictures of huge alligators and reports of 28 foot alligators or even 20 foot alligators, not true. So generally females are between six and eight feet and males are between eight to 10 feet. That's the average size and you will get bigger animals. And in places like Lake Okeechobee, there are, there are a lot of animals that are, you know, in the 12, maybe even the, the 13 foot range. But the official record of an animal is 14 feet, nine and a quarter inches. 
And so this is kind of the maximum length of a documented alligator. The prior to this paper being published, there was the record from Louisiana, which was 18 feet, um, three inches, I think, which was an unofficial measurement because it was done by using the barrel of a gun because they, they didn't have a measuring tape. So they just kind of laid the gun down and counted out how many times and they went back and measured it. But so, so alligators don't get as big as uh, some people will let you believe. And um, one of the other famous pictures that went around the internet was one with the alligator in the culvert where it just looked like the alligator was huge. And anybody who's ever taken um, any photographs knows that you can set things up to make them uh, look bigger or smaller depending on what your camera angle is. So one of, one of the most fascinating things about alligators to me is their whole reproductive cycle and when and where they nest and, and their whole courtship um, patterns. So mating happens in April and May, nesting is follows in June and July, and then hatching is in, in August and September. And one of the really cool things that they do is when they are mating is the males do this, this bellowing with this subsonic vibrations that make the, the, the water dance on their back. And this is a display that they use to both tell other male alligators that they're around and that they're pretty big, but it also is to attract the females. And what's really interesting is that the, the mating behavior of alligators and crocodiles is different in that the crocodiles do not exhibit this kind of bellowing behavior. And part of that is because of the different habitats that they live in. And so alligators are, occur a lot in the marsh areas where there's not a lot of, um, of um, visibility. And so they use the, the, the sounds to help um, alert the other, other animals that they're, that they're there. So alligators will nest in the marsh and they will both make a nest out of material that's there and basically create their own high ground. So you can see that it's very wet around this nest. And what the alligator did was she came in and she, she pulled up the, gra the, the sawgrass here um, with, with using her mouth and her legs and her tail to make up this pile. Uh, so they'll do this where they create their own high ground or they will take advantage of already existing high ground. And this nest happens to be on this little start of a tree island. This is some wax myrtle here. That, that grew up out of a clump of peat um, in the refuge. And she came in and just put her nest right in the middle of that, that clump and didn't have to build it up higher. And I've done a lot of studies on alligator nesting in the refuge. And one of the things that was really interesting was that 90% of the nests are actually on tree islands. So in Everglades National Park, a lot of the nests are out in the marsh area. So they're more susceptible to flooding because they're actually closer to the water table. Whereas in, in the refuge, they're much less susceptible to flooding because they'll put them on little tree islands like this or uh, a bigger tree island um, back in that, that has a little bit higher ground. So the mama alligator will, and this is, a, this is a nest that was, this is from South Carolina, and this is I made out of cattail. And again, you can see that she just pulled up all of the cattail around here and piled it up and, and made her own, her own high ground. And they do, alligators will defend their nests. Not every alligator defends their nests, but, but um, a fair number of them do. And that makes the alligator nests very good nest sites for other reptiles um, and um, uh, other, other things like turtles and lizards. And so, the turtles will lay their eggs in the alligator nest, and then they get the benefit of having the protection from the mama alligator, as well as having the high ground there. So the eggs that they lay are a little bit bigger than goose eggs, and they're a hard shell, very similar. They're like chicken eggs, and um, they are, she'll lay any way where from 30 to 60 eggs, depending on where you are in the alligator's range. And down here, it's closer to 30 to 40, whereas some of the nests, uh, when I was working in South Carolina, we had as many as 60 eggs in the nest. And so she puts them in this cavity here um, in, in several different layers. 
and they incubate for about 63 days. And then when they're done incubating, she'll come back and she'll open the nest. And what she's, she, when she, how did and people ask, well, how do they know when to open the nest? Well, the little baby alligators make a little distress call that sounds like this. And when she hears that, she'll come and she'll help them out of the nest. So she'll open up the nest. And one of the things that I think is the really coolest about alligators is she will, this is an animal that can crush a turtle shell with her jaws. And she will come and she will pick up the eggs in her mouth and she will roll them around in her mouth and crack them and gently let the baby out without any marks on it. Um, the baby alligators also have what's called an egg tooth right on the edge of their snout. So they can kind of carve out the shell a little bit to help themselves get out um, so in, in case you know, she doesn't get to, to, to all of them. And when the alligators hatch, they're this kind of black with yellow cross bands on them. And that helps them to blend in to the marsh environment. And so they're very hard to see when they're moving around in there and they're intermixed with the kind of the dead vegetation, the dead sawgrass or the, or the dead cattails. So one of the other things that people always ask me is, is, is um, actually they ask me about it, how many alligators are there in the refuge? And I jokingly say two bazillion because we don't have a, count, a, a total count of the alligators. What we do is we look at um, uh, transects and so we get a relative abundance along the transects but we don't extrapolate that out to the whole, whole area. But a lot of times people think there's, I've, I've heard people tell me there's too many alligators. And part of this is because they're seeing alligators in the canals or they're seeing them in the di dry season when they're all concentrated. And one of the things is, and this is with Everglades restoration too, is that, that we want the alligators in the marsh, not so much in the canals because canals are not, they're not a natural habitat. And what we found is that there are fewer alligator holes closer to the canals than there are in areas where there are not canals. And if you remember from that, where I talked about alligators as ecological engineers, a key role of alligators is to create those low ground areas. And so if you have a bunch of canals, then those low ground areas aren't being created immediately adjacent to those canals. Canals also are dominated by larger animals and as you saw in the slide before and, and shown again here, um, the larger allig alligators will prey on, on the smaller an animals. And then we had a graduate student that looked at reproduction and recruitment in canals versus marshes. And the blue bar here are, these are the average percent of the, the um, nests that hatched in the marsh. And you can see it's over 70, 75% whereas it's only about 25% in the canal. And then they, he also looked at how long did the baby survive? And again, you could see that the, in the canal, the survival um, for the baby alligators is much lower than it is for the marsh. So even though people see a lot of alligators in the canals, that's not really where we want them. It's not really a good place to be for a good healthy population of alligators. And so the work that we do focuses on alligators in the marsh so we can better understand how to get them back in the marsh and how to create the conditions there that, that we're looking for. And so to do that, we do a series of monitoring where we look at status and trends and then relationships to hydrology or the water patterns. Are we doing the water management the way that would be better for alligators? And we look at two different things when we do this. We look at how many alligators there are, relative abundance, where they are, distribution, and then body condition. And I'll talk a little bit about, about each of those and some of the studies that we've done. So if you remember back from the earlier slide, we talked about our restoration hypotheses with the altered water depths and how that has reduced body condition and relative abundance. And so this is just a, a, a kind of a, a graphic a little cartoon of how we think that works. And so we think that the, the changes in water depths and pattern and, and salinity can affect prey abundance, 
which can affect alligator abundance and can also affect body condition. Um, we also think that like removing canals or putting canals in can affect the number of alligator, occupied alligator holes. I showed you before that where you have um, canals, you have less alligator holes near the canals and, and that can affect prey abundance, which can then affect alligator abundance. And so we have this relationship between these different factors and it all goes back to, you know, how does, how does the hydrology influence these different things? And then how does that influence the, um, the things that we're measuring relative to alligators, the alligator abundance and the body condition. And so one of the things that we've done is we've, we've created a way to talk about this um, and to communicate progress in a familiar format of a stoplight. So red, yellow, and green. And so red means we're well below the restoration target. Yellow means we're below the restoration target and green means we meet the restoration target. And so in the next graphs, you'll see either lines that are, are red, yellow, or green or uh, the background of the slide showing where it's red, yellow, or green to just give you some perspective of how close or how far we are from where we think we need to be and um, for in, to get back to what we want with uh, these measures for a restoration. All right, so the first, the first measure is the relative abundance and distribution. And so how do we do that? Well, we go out and we do nighttime spotlight surveys. And so take the airboat out and we drive around with a, a light and look for eyes. And then we sneak, I, I tell you, we sneak up on them in the airboat um, and uh, get a size estimate. And, and we do this over um, in a lot of different areas. I do the surveys in the refuge up here, but we have people who have done surveys in all of these different areas of water conservation area two, three, Everglades National Park, and, and all the way into the estuary. And so we started these in, um, actually started the surveys at Locks in August of 1998. Um, but some of the other areas we started later. And so we have a good period of record from 2003 2012, where we were able to look at the trends of alligators in different areas and then relate that to um, hydrology. And so on the left here, you can see the different areas. We have um, Frog City, which is in Everglades National Park, Tower, which is in Conservation Area 3, Shark Slough, which is Everglades National Park, Conservation Area 2, um, and then a couple other areas of water conservation areas, three and three, three A and three B. And you can see that um, the North 41 transect is, is green, but everything else is either yellow or red. Now Loxahatchee is not on here because Loxahatchee is actually way up here. So it is actually, if, if I were an alligator, Lox is where I would be because it's got, it's got, um, more alligators there than any uh, per kilometer than any of these other areas. And it's got a, a great habitat mosaic um, and a lot of, of, of food. And, and so it's just, it's just a good place to be an alligator. And so when we looked at this, we looked at, well, okay, so these are the average numbers in those areas, but are those getting, numbers getting bigger or smaller? And so on this graphic here, the blue lines indicate, the blue solid lines indicate that there is no trend, which means they're not declining or they're not increasing. And then the dotted lines mean that they were, we were seeing a declining trend over that period. And what we found was that the alligator abundance declined in, in areas that tended to be drier. So they had hydro periods um, that, that were less than 11 months per year. The hydro period is just the amount of time that there is water in the marsh. And when dry, so what we want, if we want to have good populations of alligators is we want longer hydro periods that are longer than 11 months per year. That if there are dry downs, because dry downs are an important part of Everglades ecology, but they can't, they shouldn't be for too long. So 40 days and we don't wanna have them too often. So we don't wanna have dry downs every year. Um, there should be at least two years between dry downs and probably better to have one every five years. 
And um, so this can then help us when we think about designing Everglades restoration plans and how to do water management in different areas because so much of the water and the patterns are, are managed that we have some ability to adjust these things if, if we're not getting the conditions that we want. So another part of this, this was actually a different study that, that we did looking at um, the um, relative abundance, but it, it has very similar results in that we, in what we have here is that this is the minimum water level in the refuge. And it's, it's in um, uh, uh, meters above sea level. Um, this line here, this vertical line is where, we're, where the conditions are dry for an alligator. And this vertical dash line, I mean, horizontal dash line here is where the population would be stable. And so where we have higher annual stages, minimum annual stages, we had an increase in the population. In the years where we had lower minimum stages, so it was drier, we had decreases in population. And so this is, this is similar to what we saw in the other analysis that these drier conditions could really drive um, how the populations are um, are proceeding. So a paper that I'm working on right now is looking at pods of young. So that's what you call a bunch of baby alligators is a pod. And what I've been able to do is I've been able to look at using our, our uh, surveys, look at how many pods of young I've observed every year on that same transect. And what I've seen is that since uh, 1998, when we first started the surveys, there's been a decline in the number of pods of young. And then I did some analyses relating this to the hydrology. And one of the things that, that I looked at was the water levels during the courtship and mating period. And in the years when courtship and mating was higher, I mean, when water levels in the courtship and mating period were higher, there were more pods of young. And so, I mean, this makes sense because one of the things is when the alligators are in the marsh, the male moves around to the females. And so if the water levels are too low, it takes a lot of energy for that male to move around. And so he's not going to be able to get to as many females, or there's just not going to be as much movement in general. In addition to that, um, there are some relationships with the food availability. And I'll talk a little bit about that when I talk about body condition. So we're seeing this kind of declining trend in relative abundance, both across the Everglades, but also in the, in the refuge itself. Now in locks, there's, there's a lot of alligators. And so it's not as critical that they're declining as it is in some of the other areas where there's very few alligators. So in summary on that for the relative abundance, we have evidence that the water depth patterns affect the, the abundance. And so basically how long the marsh stays wet. And then if the marsh dries, how long it stays dry and when it stays dry, which time of year and what's going on in terms of um, the water depths during the courtship and mating. And again, this can help as we move forward with Everglades restoration planning, both in terms of helping to design the structures and how to help determine how much water needs to be in different areas, but also in terms of the operations and making some recommendations on when there should be water at, at different levels. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on to our second measure, which is body condition. And so body condition is basically the body mass index for an alligator. So you know how you go to the doctor and they tell you your body mass index is whatever. Well, we do that for alligators. So we go out, and we catch them um, and we use these same areas and each of these dots is an alligator that, that we've caught. And this is actually an old slide. So there's a whole bunch more dots on here now. So we have a, we have a huge sample of over probably 5,000. It may even be more closer to 7,000 alligators now um, that we've gone out, caught, weighed and measured and marked and, and sexed and um, 
this is one of the fun things about about doing alligator research, getting your hands on them and and uh, um, collecting this information that could ultimately help us with Everglades restoration. And so one of the things that we found is that um, we have a range of body conditions from animals that you can tell are visibly much better condition. They've got these nice jowls to ones that maybe not so much. So there, you see this guy's got a, a much skinnier neck, um, no nice fat deposits ar around his neck. And so we can use this to understand whether or not there's enough food resources within the Everglades, not only for alligators, but also for things like wading birds um, and, and the other critters that live there. And we've done this at Loxahatchee since 1998. And we go out in the spring and the fall and we catch 15 alligators and we do an average body condition. And so here again, we've got our green, which is meets the restoration target, everything above that, the red, Below that is very far from the restoration target and yellow is, is in between. We haven't met the target yet. And so you can see that there's a lot of fluctuations in body condition, but the majority of them are not above. We are not meeting our target for alligator body condition um, in the refuge except in a, in a few years. And so as with the relative abundance, the question is why and then what can we do about that? And, and, you know, do we need to worry about it? And so I did a, a paper on looking at body condition from 2000 to 2014, and this is across all of those sampling units. And what we find, found was that over that time period that, that the average body condition had declined um, and that we're about 10% lower in body condition across the Everglades than we were back in the early 2000s. And I think this has to do with the hydrology and that basically we're getting drier in the Everglades. And that's, that's not necessarily a good thing either for the alligators or for the, the fish that they eat. And in fact, one of the, um, another, another uh, scientist, Joel Trexler, who works on fish, he saw a very similar pattern in his fish data where from the 2000s down to, net to the 2014, that there'd been this decline in fish biomass in a number of his, his sites. And so one of the things with this study was in looking at the, how, it, how body condition changed relative to water patterns. What I found was that body condition was positively correlated with the fluctuations in water depth. So the range in water depths, how What's the difference between the high and the low values? And then the fall depth. We did some modeling and, and tried to uh, determine what are the best factors for describing the pattern between water depths and um, alligator body, body condition. And what we found was that hydroperiod was important, that water depths both in the spring and the fall were important, but also the how much fluctuation there is and the flux and the and the interactions between the fluctuations and the, both the spring and the fall water depths. And so this confirms some of the hypotheses about how mount marshes function, where um, there are a number of other studies talking about productivity in marshes that speak to the need to have fluctuating hydrology. So you can't, if you just have the same water depth, you basically have a pond, you don't have a marsh. And, and they're not as productive. And so this, this gives us again, some information that we can use when we're thinking about um, operations plans and how we would do the hydro, hydrologic management in, air, in an area. So we don't wanna just keep the, the water at one level. We wanna make sure that it fluctuates appropriately um, across the seasons. So when we were, right after we finished that study, uh, 2014, there were a number of reports of skinny or emaciated alligators from Southwest Florida, including at the Florida Panther National Wildlife Refuge. And so we actually got some money to do a study at Florida Panther National Wildlife Refuge and compare alligators at the refuge there 
with alligators over here in locks and the rest of the, the uh, greater Everglades. And the, there were a couple of questions that we were interested in addressing. One was, are the number of skinny alligators over in Panther Refuge different than the number of skinny alligators that we see over in this part of the Everglades? Because I mean, it's just like with people, you've got, you've got a range of body conditions. Not everybody is gonna be average. You have some that are gonna be fatter and you're gonna have some that are gonna be skinnier. And so it's not unusual to have skinny alligators, but if you have too many skinny alligators, that's, that's a bad sign. So we did a study where we went out and we caught alligators in all these areas. And we also took blood samples because one of the other things was looking at what's the physiological relationship between body condition and the health of the alligator. And so what we found was that, um, so this is all the animals we caught in that study. And we found that the alligators at Florida Panther National Wildlife Refuge, when during this study, there were no skinny alligators. And in fact, at that time, they were actually fatter than all of the other alligators. So this is a histogram that shows the red here on this side are the animals that are in poor condition that don't meet our restoration target by a lot. The yellow band in the middle here is the ones that are getting close to the restoration target. And the ones here on the right are the ones that meet or exceed our restoration target. And so you can see for the, the top bars here, this is, this is locks, that it's, it's kind of a bell-shaped curve there with the majority of them in the middle um, and a few up in this good range. But for the panther refuge, almost all of them were in this, this meets restoration targets um, if we use the ones for the greater Everglades. And then um, Everglades National Park and Water Conservation Area 3 were very similar to, to locks. And so we started looking at the blood work and what we found was that the ones in better condition, there were correlations with cholesterol, triglycerides, and glucose, all of which are indicators of feeding status and how much, how much, um, um, nutrients they've been able to, to consume. Um, and so this tells us that the alligators in better body condition, there is definitely a physiological relationship between body condition and alligator health. And so this was really interesting because like I said, this, the study all got started because there were skinny alligators in the refuge and we didn't find any skinny alligators. And one of the reasons we think that that is the case is that that period where they were seeing the skinny alligators was a period of really uh, dry conditions over there and fluctuating hydrology. And then when we did our study, it was much more, um, much more quote, normal hydrology. And the other thing about the, the the ecosystem over at Florida Panther is, for those of you who have been in Southwest Florida, know that it's a very different system than over in Loxahatchee, in that it um, it's a it's a pine flatwood cypress um, mix area with more uplands interspersed, and we think that perhaps they're maybe they're eating more mammalian prey, which promote in general better body condition. Um, in, in crocodilians. So some really neat stuff that's showing the, be, the relationship between body condition and um, these physiological factors. And so going back to our restoration hypotheses, these studies that we've been doing have allowed us to dig into this notion that water depths um, have contributed to the changes in abundance and body condition and allowed, have allowed us to communicate, uh, create these communication tools that to show what's going on with the system. And then as we do restoration, we're looking forward to seeing our, our graphics go from red and yellow to more yellow and green, and then ultimately to green as we're able to adjust the hydrology based on the data that we've collected that show what are the more optimal conditions for alligators, um, both for alligators 
and crocodiles so that we can continue to say, see you later alligator after a while crocodile and have both of them here and be the only place in the world where we can say that and be biologically correct. And so with that. Fantastic, Laura, thank you. Um, a few questions coming in. Uh, the, the question of are there metrics or a definition for a dry down period? And, um, and I'll just follow up on that with um, how has it been lately? You know, you were talking about the frequency of dry down periods. Yeah, so um, that's a really good question about the is there a metric for the dry downs? Because um, yes, and it's different depending on on what critter you are. So for alligators, we've defined a dry down as 15 centimeters or about six inches. And the reason we've done that is because um, if you're an alligator and you're trying to move around in the marsh, then it, it's really hard to move around if you don't have more water than that. Now, the fish guys, they have a different definition of dry down and theirs is five centimeters. And if you talk to a vegetation person, they might have a different definition of below surface. And so it's really interesting because we have to make sure that when we're talking with people about that, that we clarify that um, because it could make a difference in how you do the water management. If I'm saying a dry down is 15 centimeters and you're saying it's zero centimeters. So really, really good question. And, and I did have in one of my notes to mention that and, and uh, yeah, just, just didn't get around to it. And how about recent history on dry downs? So it depends on where you are. Um, and so for example, in the refuge, they have been working on keeping, on, on keeping higher water levels in the wet season um, and not having it dry down as much. And then um, we've had a couple of wet years. And if any of you are familiar with the Tamiami Trail Bridge projects, one of the purposes of those bridges is to allow more water into Northeastern Shark Slough to reduce the number of dry downs. And when we've had the wet years, that, that's been successful. So there's a lot of, of both regional variability in whether it's a regionally wet or dry year, but also local variability in terms of how much of that water can be moved in and out of different areas. Another question here about the impact of pythons, if, if any. Um, so everybody's seen the videos or the pictures of alligators eating pythons and pythons eating alligators. And so that's going to happen. Um, and it's like another large predator. So now there's another large predator out there. We, we don't really know what kind of implications that has yet in the, in the big picture. Um, we haven't seen anything specifically. And the, to date, the food that the python's eating has been different than the food that we think the alligators are eating. However, if the pythons eat everything, out, you know, eat all the, ma the mammals and the, the birds and the things that they're already eating now and then start eating the fish that the, and turtles that the alligators are eating, there could be some issues with just, just uh, resources. So um, it's a it's a really it, yeah it's a it's a really complex question and and like I said we haven't seen anything that's a you know real definitive that there's any big impact. Interesting question here about how you define restoration Everglades restoration what that actually means. Um, and I suppose it's it's a question of is is there a, an understood standard for that at this point? Well, so um, yes and no. So so a lot of Everglades restoration, and when I was talking about what I primarily was talking about here was relative to the comprehensive Everglades restoration plan. 
and relative to and that's also called SERP. So relative to SERP, yes, there are in the in what we affectionately call the yellow book, which was the document that was put together in 1999, 2000, that it has some some goals for restoration, and that all of the work that an entity called Restoration Coordination Verification Recover has been doing has been focused on defining what the attributes, ecological attributes are that would indicate that we have restoration. Um, and so this is the hydrologic part of it. And it is only, it is a part of it. There are, there's more aspects to it that are um, addressed by the South Florida Ecosystem Restoration Task Force, like the invasive exotic species, um, and, and then some of the other aspects of how the human and the uh, ecological environment work. Does a female alligator reuse a nest? Um, sometimes, um, yeah, and, and she'll come back and sometimes she'll use the exact same spot and just build it up again. Sometimes she'll go over a little bit and create a new mound. And then sometimes she'll like go 10 or 15 yards away and do it. But yes, they will, they will use, reuse the same site. Uh, there was a, uh, someone noticed a peak in the body composition of alligators around 2012 in your chart. Yep. And the question is, was there an event that led yes. to that surge? Oh, interesting. Yes. So, um, so yeah, so it was really interesting because that peak was at fall after we had the really dead, dry, dry season in, shoot, I get water years and calendar years mixed up, but it was, two, the, the two, I think it was 2011. And it got really, really dry for a long period of time. And um, I was actually surprised in the fall when we went out and we got that, but then I thought about it a little bit. And so here's what I think happened in, in the refuges that, well, as it dried down, alligators moved into places where there were these alligator holes. So if you remember the picture of the big alligator eating the little alligator, if you went in an alligator hole, it could be a refugia or it could be a bad place to be because there's a bigger alligator in there. So, and I think what happened is the alligators that were left in the fall after that dry down were the ones that were in the holes eating everything else. So it was, it was right after that drought. Wow, that's interesting. Here's a question about someone who saw a turtle being drowned by an alligator rather than the alligator crushing it and eating yeah. it. Yeah, uh, that's, that's interesting, wow. So my suspicion is that, that yeah, later on it got, it got crunched. <laughs> Makes sense. Um, do they, do you, does the refuge adjust the square miles of marshes? In other words, the water level in the marsh? So, like in the canals? Yes. Yeah, so the refuge does not, the, there, the water levels in the refuge are managed by what's called a regulation schedule. And that regulation schedule is managed by the Corps of Engineers um, in conjunction with the South Florida Water Management District. And so there is, there's actually a set, there's a set of lines where go by season that above this level, you, you need to let water out of the refuge um, and you shouldn't let the water level get below this. There are coordination meetings between the refuge and, and the core and the district and then the other Lake Worth drainage district and other partners to talk about what that fluctuation should be. Um, based on the rainfall and the other things going on in the environment. Um, do mother gators supervise their young into the next uh, nesting season? Sometimes they do. Um, and, and so this is another really interesting thing and difference between alligators and crocodiles. So mama alligators will be maternal for two or th even two or three years. And one of the things that we noticed when we did some studies on alligator holes in conservation area three was that there would be a main hole and that's where the mama alligator would be with that year's babies. 
And then there would be like these satellite holes and they'd have alligators from like two years ago and then alligators from three years ago. So it's like they get to a certain size and she kicks them out of the right where she is so that she can have another nest that year. But they will be maternal like that. Unlike crocodiles and the mama crocodile will take the babies out of the nest, but then she's gone. She just leaves them and they're on their own. Here's a question about uh, how safe is it to kayak and canoe at night, but I would say I would ask any time of day. Uh, it's a question I get a lot when I tell people about the uh, canoe trail at the refuge and yeah. knowing that there are a lot of alligators in there. Yeah, so I mean it's safe, but you have to be aware and um, smart about when and where you go. So for example, if it's it's if it's one of the periods where there's a real dry down and you're looking out in the canal and you're seeing 16 alligator heads right by the boat ramp there, I would not be putting a kayak in. <laughs> but if the water level's high and you're going on the marsh on the uh, canoe trail and you're paying attention to what you're you know what you're doing, then yes, it's 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 perfectly safe. Question about the speckled caimans. Uh, are there are they present in locks and uh, in any number? What? How many? No, fortunately, no, they're not. the The places where we know that there are breeding populations are it's the Homestead Air Force Base and uh, that area around there, down Homestead near the Turkey Point Power Plant site, and then there are a couple of known breeding. Um, sites along Camiari Ami Trail. But other than that, they are not as widespread. And I think part of that is they're, they're also, um, caimans are a, a another tropical species in general. And so they don't do as well in the cold as alligators do. So I think sometimes when we have these cold snaps like the one in 2010, that perhaps that helps to keep them from expanding their range. Okay, these were all very intelligent questions. I'm going to ask a touristy question. Okay. <laughs> uh, what is the best time of year to see alligators and what time of day is best? Okay, so um, as long as you're not taking your kayak out when the, during, the, during the dry season is the easiest time to see them because they're more concentrated. And so the... And the actual, the best time to see them would be after you had a cool night and you have a bright, sunny, warm day. Yeah. So, yeah. They're out catching rays. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, I guess here's a question and we'll make this the last question. These were all fantastic, everybody. Uh, are nuisance gators around human populations relocated or euthanized? But I think it gets to a bigger question of just human interaction with gators, you know, and how they look at humans and and how all, humans all look at alligators. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so they they are euthanized um, for the most part. I mean, I think sometimes if you get a small alligator, like a less than four foot, in somebody's swimming pool. And there happens to be a canal there, they'll throw them back in the canal. But in most cases, they're, they're euthanized. And um, this is what I tell people, because I'll have people, they know that I work on alligators and say, oh, I saw an alligator in my canal, what should I do? And I said, just leave it. And it's like, oh, shouldn't I call the commission? And it's like, no, if you call the commission and too many people complain, they'll send out the nuisance trapper and that alligator's dead. So in a lot of cases in the residential areas, the alligators are moving through looking for a place that's more suitable. And so if you just wait a few days, they'll disperse. Now, if you have a situation where you have an alligator coming up in your backyard because you're right on a canal and you have children or small pets, then that's a, and it's regularly there, that's, that's a different situation. Laura, thank you so much. We oh, you're uh, welcome. appreciate your expertise and time and uh, everybody will be posting a recording of the video and sending it out to everyone. Uh, and then we'll be posting it on YouTube as well. Um, I do want to let everybody know we have a few more speaker series events coming in 
February, which will be a new announcement. At, uh, that'll be an in-person event at the end of this month. And then Harvey Oyer will be with us in May. You can see this information on our website, loxahatchiefriends.com slash events. And if you happen to be here and not a member, we welcome your membership and encourage you to see what we're all about. And uh, thank you all for attending tonight. We're grateful for your, you to, your uh, support. And we'll see you uh, at the refuge. Good night. Good night. Thank you.